get started. All right, so welcome. I'm really excited to see how many of you showed up today for our live info session on the fall 2021 Saipal Scholars in Residence Bootcamp. We are really excited to basically uh, tell you all a little bit more about our program, a little bit about the application, and then we're gonna save as much time as possible as I can today for questions that you have about the application program and the residencies that you will have the opportunity to complete after the boot camp ends. My name is William Oda and I am the National Science Policy Network's scholarship program coordinator. And what I do is run various established uh, training programs and experiential learning opportunities for early career scientists and engineer members of NSPN. So I'm going to talk today specifically about SciPol Scholars in Residence and the boot camp. So a quick little overview of the SciPol Scholars program. What it is, is basically a experiential learning opportunity that uh, expands both the capacity of current graduate students or early career scientists and engineers, as well as our partner organizations. And we do this by providing a six week training boot camp for the students and then place them with an organization for a part time, primarily remote, paid uh, internship or residency. And what you do in that is work in a policy focused project that prepares you to pursue other opportunities in the science policy space once you are looking for a full time position, applying for fellowships, or any looking for any other work or positions in science policy. So we are going to have our boot camp with, we plan to have at least a boot camp with 12 individuals who are participating. We then have prepared scholar and residence positions beginning in January, 2022, that you will interview for. If you don't get one of those prepared positions, then you are able to develop your own position with myself or whoever the scholarship program coordinator is in the future, as long as you are a early career scientist and engineer member and you're able to take on that commitment and we are really really excited because we have just so many different amazing organizations and people have made or developed their own amazing partnerships when they didn't get one of those prepared positions what i think makes this experience special is that you are able to do this remotely you aren't stuck uh, working with just an organization in your physical area you are paired with a mentor in that host office who will work with you, help you work on skills, practice uh, a variety of things from communication to writing to presentation when it comes to transitioning from an academic or research position to a policy position. And then lastly, you're able to meet and work with a lot of other amazing early career scientists and engineers from NSPN. So we have a pretty robust alumni network starting up from the SciPol Scholars Program at this point. And we're really excited to continue expanding that with this next cohort. I guess I should touch on what our theme is. So we theme our uh, boot camp every cycle, and this time it is science and justice. So what this means is that we will have our standard five classes and then a special lecture from a guest lecturer on how science and justice overlap. And that'll be the conclusion to the boot camp this fall. Uh, here are some example host offices. As you guys can see, it spans uh, private and public organizations, government labs, government agencies, um, state agencies as well. So there's just a huge variety of places that you can end up for your position, depending on what your interests are and what you want to do with your residence position. If you guys have questions about the types of organizations, um, I can answer this at the end of the talk, but if you want to look up some of these, here's some logos and names, and you guys can check out where students have been placed in the past. And this list, I believe, is also now on the Science Policy Scholars webpage on sidepolnetwork.org, and I will drop that link in the chat for anyone who wants to go check that out. So for our boot camp goals, we want to empower you to engage and give you tools to speak concisely, be savvy in a policy space, and then be efficacious when you're doing those things. In order to make that happen, uh, we have a six-week boot camp 
one evening per week that will run for between one and a half and two hours with then office hours after the boot camp, as well as additional scheduled office hours as needed for you to practice skills and go over output for the class. We're going to have video lectures that are pre-recorded that you will watch, and then we will have in-class discussion and hands-on activities. So if you're familiar with the flipped classroom pedagogical model, that is what we're doing in the boot camp. This is a way to hopefully minimize Zoom fatigue. You're not getting lectured at over a computer for hours every single week. And instead, you're interacting with the other cohort members, with our expert speakers who are invited to come to the boot camp, and your course instructors who practice hands-on skills like developing an elevator pitch, writing a policy memo, practicing presentations, um, all these other skills that you will be using in your residency. Uh, after you complete the boot camp, a final portfolio consisting of two to three different products, primarily a policy memo and an elevator pitch, you will give a little final presentation at a graduation ceremony that we have. And after that, we have an interview process to place you in your residency and then the real work and real fun, at least from my perspective, is that you get to go and work in a policy organization's office for six months. When we do this, the boot camp, um, there's specific topics, but we really think in three different levels. So first, do you have a basic knowledge of the government, how that works, and how scientific information fits into that structure? The second is communication. Once you know where information needs to be delivered, how do you communicate it? And third, efficacy. How can we then make you the most sort of successful individual when you're communicating your information to a government or a policy uh, making individual? So what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? How can we improve those things? What can we teach you? Um, where can we support you? Lesson plans. I don't think um, this is the most important thing to cover in today's boot camp. I'm going to spend a little bit more time on the application in a second. But if you're concerned about sort of the level of knowledge you have coming in, this is a good slide that sort of lets you see where where we're taking you, um, what level of knowledge you should have coming in, and what level of knowledge you will have you will have after the boot camp ends. So we focus on a mid to high tier um, overview of a lot of these topics. We provide resources for you to go back and review if you think you need a refresher on them, and then our expert lecturer will be able to answer specific questions or concerns you guys have after you complete any pre-readings, uh, review the video lecture, and then come in and do exercises with us. I think, um, yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. So yeah, paid residency overview. You're going to be working remotely, but in the future, especially with COVID coming to the end, if you are in the same location as your host office, there may be opportunities for in-person work, but this is primarily, primarily a remote experience. The time load, uh, 20 hours per month, that roughly breaks down to four hours per week. We think that this is something that you're doing on top of your existing duties and responsibilities, so we don't want to have a huge hours requirement. It is paid, as you can see on the slide, it's a $3,000 stipend that's paid in two chunks uh, over the course of a six-month residency. You must be an early career scientist and engineer member of NSPN, so if you're applying to the program, make sure that you are all signed up, that you've renewed your membership, and that you're all good to go. You do not get to do the residency until you complete the boot camp. And we have monthly follow up meetings once you are placed in your residency so you don't feel lost or left on your own to deal with any challenges that you may be facing. Um, all those meetings happen with my position, the scholarship program coordinator. Um, I'm going to go back and just actually. I'm going to talk a little bit about the application. I don't have a slide for it, but our application is live. It closes at midnight Pacific time on August 15th. And the first round of the application is two short statements. I believe they're both under 300 words and a CV and experience check sheet just to sort of see what your background is before you come into our boot camp. If you were accepted um, as a finalist for the application, there is then a two week period where we ask you to write a two page in focus congressional research service style policy memo. So this is a really short format 
And we actually have a workshop that was recent complete, recently completed with Debbie Stein that you can watch that teaches you how to write one of these style policy memos. What this does is it provides a insight into your writing ability, how you currently are able to take scientific knowledge and translate it for a policymaker or a policy organization. And then it's also used as a, a product that you build on and is part of your final portfolio for the SciPol Scholars Bootcamp class. This, um, after the two week uh, period where you write your policy memo and submit it to us, we have a round of expert review from people who are internal and external to NSPN, and then we will notify our bootcamp members. That will happen in mid to late September with the bootcamp starting October 12th at the earliest. We don't actually select a final date and time uh, during the week for the bootcamp until we have all our cohort members selected in order to make it work for as many of our top choices as possible. So you don't have to know exactly what your availability is until the end of the application process. And we will work with everyone to make sure that all the people can attend. Um, at this point, I would love to open the floor to questions in the chat or if you wanna unmute yourself, uh, this is meant to be a time for you guys to ask me questions, clarify points of confusion, and then to bring up topics that you think are important that I did not cover in this short presentation. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen now and um, feel free to type or unmute yourself. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Gwendolyn. I'm glad that that was helpful for you. And then, Michael, so you say you don't have a lot of science policy experience. Should you still apply? Um, it depends what you mean by do you have a lot of science policy experience? Um, if you don't know anything about science policy, this may not be the best place for you to start out. But if you've done like maybe a lobbying effort with a local chapter at your university or through a different organization, you've learned a little bit about policy writing by attending some workshops, you've gone to AAAS, then maybe you should apply. Um, there is no clear threshold that we've established for what a minimum experience level uh, that is required is. In the future, when we have maybe more experience running the program, uh, that may come up. But I would encourage you to apply still. I think that the application should only take an hour or two maximum to fill out. And you might be able to participate and learn a lot uh, by doing uh, ahead of time. So I would encourage you still to still apply. But if you read through the application, everything, you just don't feel like you're a good fit right now, um, email me and I can provide resources that will maybe prepare you to apply in the next cohort in the spring or maybe next year in the fall as well. So um, part of my job is also to help you help connect people with resources and experiences that will make you more competitive applicants in the future. So uh, the email and I will, yeah, let me just type that in the chat, side so poll. All right, um, Morgan, do you think this would be feasible? All right, so we do actually primarily have fourth, fifth, and then first year postdoc students uh, participate in the SciPol Scholars Program. I would say that they're roughly half of the students, so a lot of people who are close to or are graduating. The best thing about the residency is you can defer it. So you don't have to immediately go into a residency in January if that's gonna overlap with your graduation from your doctoral program. Uh, we actually have some people who say that, or do not say, but who have um, finished our boot camp. then they do like a six month period where they're finishing up their dissertation. And then they're using this as a gap um, in between the boot camp or sorry, um, reading a question while I was talking. They use the residency as, a, as a, a gap program between when they graduate and when they start their first position to help sort of figure out if they wanna pursue science policy full time or as like a way to explore science policy before pursuing a postdoc and then deciding between academics and policy in the future. Um, and then for another, another question, this application does it get you into the boot camp, And then once you complete the boot camp, you're qualified for the residency. So you're able to do the boot camp, 
and then you're just qualified to apply for the residencies in the future with the program. In the application under CV and resume, it says, yeah, so it, um, we want to know what your involvement is with NSPN. If you've come to our events, we think that that helps prepare you for this program. So just list all the NSPN affiliated events um, that you've attended. If you've come to the National Symposium, places like that, there's a lot of great workshops and events that prepare you and teach you similar skills to what we want you to have coming out of the boot camp. So make sure to list those in your application. Uh, yes. So to Lauren's question, if you complete the boot camp this fall, you could apply for a position starting in January. That's the earliest round of um, residencies you would qualify for. But then as long as you're an early career member, you would still be able to come back in and complete this program or complete the residency, I guess, not the whole program. You've already done the boot camp. Okay, yeah, so I'm going to just give three hypothetical um, experience levels to this next question. So it is, could you describe the qualifications of a successful applicant? So who would very likely get in and who would not? Um, so someone who would very, very likely get in. Uh, you have been a member of your chapters, um, your NSPN University chapter science policy group for, let's say, a couple of years. You've been a member of NSPN for that same time. And this last year that you've taken on some type of role in a committee or maybe even a leadership role in NSPN, you've done a lobbying or advocacy effort to your state or the federal capital. You have outreach experience and maybe you've held a leadership position or two in your local science policy organization as well. Or, and then you have other leadership experiences and you can demonstrate that you are a strong writer through your personal statements, um, statement on why science policy is important and your policy memo. Honestly, writing ability is a huge um, factor when it comes to who gets into the program because if you are not able to clearly communicate your ideas to us in the policy memo, it's difficult for us to teach that in a short bootcamp format with just six weeks and a couple outputs. So the better you're able to demonstrate your writing ability, the probably that, that honestly might be the biggest determining factor once you meet sort of a baseline level of qualification. Um, someone who's less likely to get in but still has a, a very solid chance is you're, you've been in a local chapter for one year, you've been in the NSPN for that same amount of time, you don't have leadership experience, but you've participated in a policy memo writing workshop, a lobbying workshop, and you attended your scientific organization's advocacy uh, campaign where you wrote letters or emails to legislators. Someone who might have a tough time getting in is you just joined NSPN or a local science policy organization, you haven't really attended any workshops or events that teach you science policy skills, and you've never practiced science policy writing or communication before. So that person, they would have to have exceptional writing abilities and be able to demonstrate that in a format that you probably haven't ever practiced or used before in order to get in. Okay. Was that a pretty good explanation to your question? Great, glad that that was useful. All right, does anyone else have other questions for me? I know I saw one person came in, I think toward the end of the talk, this is recorded and it will be uploaded to the Science Policy Scholars webpage on scipolnetwork.org in a day or two. So you'll be able to go there um, I want to reiter reiterate something about the application. Um, there is a first round and there is a second round. 
the first round, we hope to be a pretty low barrier to application. It is just a couple short statements. I believe it's 250 and 300 words and then a CV that you send us. So I hope that most of you have a CV already prepared. Uh, you just want to make sure your science policy experiences that we asked for in the experience section of the round one application are highlighted. Then there is a two week window for finalists to submit, us, so to, submit to us a policy memo and then a short personal statement. And then that goes to our final reviewers. I really want to stress that that um, policy memo may sound scary, but it really isn't. It's two pages with two columns on each page. So it's a really, really short uh, format. You have some really clear direction that we provide you on what the topic is and what we wanna hear from you in that statement. And we have a whole workshop that was recorded with Debbie Stein and her Science Policy Academy that is going to be available on the Science Policy Scholars webpage and that will walk you through how to write that format, what you should include, what you should not include, and then tips and tricks. So if you haven't written that, make sure to review all the materials that go through what is a CRS memo, read some CRS style, which is the Congressional Research Service style in focus policy memos. And again, feel free to email me questions at um, Saipal scholars at saipalnetwork.org if you have further questions about that format and I can clarify um, for you guys ahead of the application, I guess. Maybe not during, that could be uh, a little bit unfair to some people, but uh, I will help out as much as I possibly can before we get to that second round of applications. All right, I'll give you guys a couple more minutes, but other than that, I think this is all the information I was hoping to cover. If you guys want, you can go watch last year's info session. I may have answered slightly different questions or covered slightly different topics, but they should be largely the same. And um, again, email SIPOL Network at, or SIPOL Scholars at SIPOLnetwork.org with questions that you have after today. This recording will be on the website soon and we will, well, not we, but I am super excited and hopefully I see all of your names in the applicant pool once I uh, get around to looking at that round one application. Have a great rest of your day and um, enjoy your Friday and weekend.